Okay, well, we'll get started. It's now 1230 and we want to try to keep this uh, as close to tw uh, 30 minutes as possible. So thank you so much for joining Strigberger Brown uh, Armstrong's first Lunch and Learn um, of a series um, that we are doing in 2021. As many of you know, we're a civil defense firm with offices in Toronto, Kitchener, Waterloo, as well as London. Our office, or our lawyers practice in a wide range of areas, including cyber and privacy liability, uh, bodily injury claims, accident benefits, property damage, as well as fraud litigation, to name just a few. Um, my name is Laura Emmett. I work in the London office, and Devin Marr uh, works in the Toronto office. And we're pleased to be speaking with you today about a brand new tort called the uh, Tort of Harassment of Internet Communications. Um, this is a pretty significant development because uh, new causes of action don't get created that often. Um, that being said, with the uh, development and increased prevalence of the internet, we've actually seen the creation of three torts um, over the last 10 years. So while the focus will be on this brand new cause of action, Devin will also be giving you some information about how this differs from um, other um, causes of action. So a couple of housekeeping matters before we start. As you can see on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A um, option. And so if you have any questions at any point, please um, put them in that. Um, and Devin and I will um, address them at the end of our presentation. Um, the other thing that I will uh, explain is that there are two polls that we've included in our presentation, which we would encourage you to answer um, when they uh, come up on your screen. Uh, so uh, what are we going to be talking about today? As you can see on this outline, the first um, topic will be uh, Kaplan and Attis, what the actual case is about. Uh, the second topic that Devin will discuss is the uh, test to be applied. Uh, Devin will then go over the differences between the other um, causes of action. And then finally, I'll end this seminar by um, briefly providing some context for potential exposure for these types of claims in the future. Uh, now, in terms of the case, um, this is a case where the court rightfully recognized, really demonstrated the inadequacies of the current legal system to respond to internet defamation and harassment. The decision actually relates to four separate claims that arise from grievances that Ms. Attas had against multiple groups of um, individuals. So within these four claims, there were uh, the court was dealing with three summary judgment motions, as well as a motion for default judgment. And as you can see on the slide, the four main um, groups um, of parties are first, a broad range of people that were related to a mortgage um, enforcement proceeding that was taken against Ms. Attas in the early 2000s. The second relates to a um, mortgage proceeding arising when Ms. Attas refinanced two of her properties in the shadow of the first dispute. The third are those individuals that successfully brought a motion to have Ms. Attas be um, deemed a vexatious litigant. And then finally, there were parties connected to Ms. Attas being fired in the 1990s. Um, because of alleged dishonesty and unethical conduct when she worked as a real estate agent. Um, and so what I've done on the next slide is included a sentence from the, uh, it's the second sentence of the case. Um, and what was meant by um, the court when they talked about the defendant using the internet um, to spread vicious falsehoods against people. What it meant was that Ms. Attas's favorite pastime was cyber stalking. She would research people that she felt had wronged her. Um, so to give you an example, she read obituaries of the deaths of family members that she had a grudge against. And then she would attack anonymously every single person that she could identify that was connected to that person that she disliked. On one occasion, she actually emailed the daughter of someone's, um, someone that she didn't like um, and the daughters, all of the daughter's employees that she worked with um, to try to spread falsehoods against the daughter. No one was immune from her wrath. Her own lawyers, opposing counsel, siblings, spouses, children, employees, employers, everyone was a target. 
All told, by the time that this case was heard in court, there were as many as 150 victims identified. The judge also noted that nothing stopped her attacks. She would use unpoliced platforms such as Reddit, Facebook, um, Pinterest, um, which allowed her to be anonymous but unrelenting in her attacks. There were motions and court proceedings. And from January 2018 until now, there are actually 45 different endorsements made available in Canley um, related to her, and then additional handwritten endorsements that wouldn't have been reported. Being a vexatious lit litigant didn't stop her, and even spending 75 days in jail um, for contempt uh, did not slow her down. So what were the types of actions that um, were connected to her? The attack started in the 1990s, before the prevalent use of the internet, um, where the initial harassment took the form of letters and using what the judge called her poison pen. I could literally spend the entire 30 minutes telling you um, about um, all of the attacks levied against her, but in the interest of time, I wanted to just use one plaintiff's um, harassment as an example of what she was doing. So there was an individual, Mr. Babcock. And in 1999, his wife died. And shortly afterwards, he received an anonymous letter in the mail at home. The comments made in the letter are so offensive that I can't share them today, but I will read you one sentence that will give you a flavor of the tone of her letter. The image of her bloated, ugly corpse engulfed in flames tickles the soul. However, an incinerator would have been more appropriate. That letter was followed up by letters to Mr. Babcock's neighbors suggesting that he was a sexual predator. After the police were involved, the harassment suddenly stopped for about 17 years until Ms. Attas started defaming Mr. Um, Babcock and his family again. Unknown to him, um, starting in 2016, Ms. Attas started making online posts against the Babcock family, suggesting they were scammers, thieves, pedophiles, dangerous pedophiles, and engaging in fraud. Pictures of these individuals were also included in her post. And then this went on for two years, unknown to the Babcock family. And the only reason why they learned about this online harassment was because Miss Atta started sending emails to members of a club that Mr. Babcock was a member of, alleging that he and his son were um, pedophiles. This harassment and defamation was similar to the attacks faced by um, other plaintiffs. So the court was left to determine whether there was any way to control her conduct other than locking her up or forcing her to um, obtain treatment. So before turning it over to Devin to talk to you about the actual facts, or sorry, uh, uh, the actual um, test, we have poll one. So you've had a flavor um, of the case. So what do you think is the focus of the new tort, the conduct or the harm? And we'll give about 10 more seconds. All right, and the results are both uh, are weighed equally. So I will turn it over to Devin to let you uh, explain what the correct answer is. All right, thanks for that, Laura. I don't know if I give the correct answer so much as what we think the right answer is. So uh, the test that was developed by Justice Corbett from our perspective really focuses on the conduct of the defendant or the conduct of the harasser. Uh, so what we've done on this slide here is put up the, the full legal test uh, for the, the new tort. Uh, in the actual decision, it's not broken down like this. We've sort of tried our best to break it down into three main parts. And so the test is where the defendant maliciously or recklessly engages in communications conduct so outrageous in character, duration, and extreme in degree, so as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and tolerance. Uh, and they have to have the, with the intent to cause fear, anxiety, emotional upset, or to impugn the dignity of the plaintiff. And then the plaintiff has to suffer that harm. And so you can kind of see from the way we've broken this down, there is a lot of heavy lifting in that first uh, part. You know, most of the adjectives and 
you know, compound sentence. It's, it's all in the first part. And so that's, I think, where we're going to spend most of our time today uh, in our, our short little webinar and uh, to do our best to sort of flesh it out. So unpacking the first part, like I said, this is where all the heavy lifting is generally done uh, from our perspective. The, you're looking at, you know, malicious or reckless conduct. Uh, and the, the courts have had the opportunity to to say what malicious means, uh, often in the context of defamation, uh, because a lot of the defenses in defamation are, are defeated by a finding of malice. Uh, and so malice in, in the legal context, uh, or generally speaking, uh, in, a, in a popular context, you know, we understand it to mean spite or ill will against a, a specific individual. The, the law has recognized that it can be broader than that, though. Uh, it can be an indirect motive or an improper purpose uh, that conflicts with whatever duty you're, you're attempting to allege. You're saying, I have a reason to, to say these things, um, but you're, you're, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, as an example, you know, actual malice and spite is pretty easy. I hate someone, I'm going to go and harass them on the internet. The, an example of the indirect malice might be that uh, you you dislike an organization or a, a movement. And so what you're going to do is you're going to target people who are involved in that movement or organization. You may not have no specific ill will against them as individuals, um, but you're essentially using them as your target to undermine the organization or hurt the, the movement. And so that's what we mean when we talk about sort of an indirect uh, or improper purpose. Uh, and the case law has also seen that you know, dishonesty or knowing that something is tr untrue or not caring whether or not it's true also would constitute malice. And so that's you know, where, we, where we think, because this is brand new and hasn't been reviewed yet, uh, where we're going to see uh, the requirement for malice. Um, interestingly, it talks about communications conduct and obviously the tort is you know, internet harassment. Uh, but communications conduct, you know, Justice Corbett did a good job of, of citing lots of papers and extrinsic evidence as to, you know, what that really means. And it's really a, a broad term that means engaging in conduct, you know, using the internet um, that can be offline as well as online. So a good example of sort of uh, communications conduct that is offline is doxing, which if people aren't aware of, is when you essentially put private information or you know, identifiable information about a specific person onto the internet uh, with the purpose of having other people harass them. So, or, or swatting where you, know, you make a 911 call through you know, an IP uh, connection, basically having the police show up in the real world to someone's house to harass them. Uh, so these are examples of using the internet to implicate real world uh, events. And so when we talk about outrageous character and duration, uh, there actually is a fair amount of uh, case law as to what outrageous really means. And we see a lot of it in the employment context, um, as well as when we talk about these other torts like intentional infliction of mental suffering um, is really actually the, the big one and the tort of harassment, which technically doesn't exist uh, according to the Court of Appeal, and we'll, we'll get to that, uh, they do talk about what outrageous conduct might look like. Uh, and so historically, uh, you know, there, there was a, a, the Boucher and Walmart case, which the Court of Appeal upheld, and that was a, a case where essentially a manager was uh, belittling and mocking someone in front of their coworkers for, for a period of six months. And that was found to be outrageous conduct. Uh, there was uh, Prinzo and Baycrest, which is sort of a classic uh, case for intentional infliction of mental suffering, uh, where this was just repeatedly contacting someone who was off work, trying to get them back to work, uh, and eventually uh, dismissing them when they, they did show up to work. And that was a period of four to five months. And they've also, the courts have found that, you know, firing someone where for, for theft that was unfounded was also flagrant and outrageous. So we do have a sense of, of the, the flavor of what outrageous means uh, in these sorts of torts. Um, what is interesting in this case is that it talks about duration. So it seems to suggest that this can't just be a one-off, 
uh, it has to be sort of a campaign. And if you uh, do get a chance to read the facts for the Addis case, which I highly recommend because it is riveting, you can see that this was a decades long campaign um, and it really sort of fits the bill. And then extreme in degree, again, this is really just you know, excessive uh, conduct from what we can tell. And, and these need to be fleshed out. The, the one part I'm, you know, we're a little bit uh, unsure of how it's gonna be treated is this beyond all bounds of possible decency and tolerance. You know, it doesn't say a reasonable person, uh, but we can assume that this is supposed to be an objective test. It's, you know, society uh, as a whole. Um, what above and beyond or beyond all possible bounds means, it, it's probably above highly offensive, which is what you hear in some other torts. And quite frankly, it's probably above flagrant and outrageous uh, in, in other torts as well. I mean, this just seems to be the beyond the pale uh, horrific uh, conduct. And it's really meant to be, the, the focus again is on the conduct of the person uh, perpetrating these acts and it has to just be you know, horrific. And that sort of takes us to the second part, which in our opinion, slightly less important, um, especially when compared to some of the other torts. Uh, this is really an intent to cause fear, anxiety, emotional upset, um, or impugn the dignity of, of the, the plaintiff. Or sorry, yeah, the plaintiff. Um, and so when we talk about this, unlike some of the other torts that address these sorts of uh, wrongs, this doesn't focus on the type of harm or the diagnosis. It doesn't require severe distress or you know, a diagnosis of a psychiatric illness or anything like that. Um, you don't have to have an impairment as a result of this conduct. It really is just, you know, fear, anxiety, emotional upset. You know, this is not, uh, does to me at least, uh, isn't a particularly high bar. And then again, when we're talking about the, the dignity of the plaintiff, uh, it is quite broad. Uh, and, you know, it seems to allow the court to make findings uh, without medical evidence, which was really the case uh, in the, the Kaplan and Addis case that the court found that the other torts that were available actually didn't quite fit the bill. Uh, in the case of intentional infliction of mental suffering, there just wasn't enough evidence before the court to say that they had met the requisite uh, harm. That there was no medical evidence saying that they had, you know, were depressed or anxious or anything like that. So from our perspective, this is really more about dealing with the conduct. And, and again, dignity is quite broad uh, and really probably goes beyond reputation and uh, that would be addressed by a defamation claim, for example. And then the, the third part, the, the plaintiff has to suffer that harm. And from my reading of the case, it doesn't have to be the exact same thing as they intended. So if someone intended for you to become very stressed uh, but ultimately ended up getting you fired, maybe because you're unable to work because of the stress or your employer doesn't want you to uh, be involved, doesn't want to be involved in the sort of collateral damage, um, I, that would likely satisfy this test from our perspective. It, it's not like some of the other tests or proposed tests where there has to be a direct link. And the, the courts have generally found that you, know, you, you take your victim as you find them, you intended to cause harm. If the harm is greater than you expected, too bad. And again, the harm from our perspective goes beyond just personal injury. Uh, quite frankly, I, I could see this falling into sort of an economic loss claim as well. Again, as the example, uh, maybe you're, you work for someone and your employer decides to let you go because your employer is tired of having phone calls. Uh, all hours of the day of your employer of, of a mystery person or or posts going on the internet saying you know don't work here they hire terrible people and they might just say we don't want to deal with this and and so that could be a, a type of harm as well so we've done our best to try and break the test down into plain english it's not that plain i apologize uh, but essentially it's using the internet as a means to intentionally inflict harm on an individual and repeatedly engaging in this conduct. That's a way that is just objectively beyond the pale. And so what that's going to mean is will have to be fleshed out by the courts, uh, assuming that this survives. 
uh, because the Court of Appeal in 2019 essentially said this may not, uh, this sort of harassment tort shouldn't exist, but here we are. Uh, in terms of the remedies, uh, there wasn't a, a specific request for damages in this case, and Justice Corbett found that uh, an apology or an injunction wouldn't really work uh, because the, the defendant, Addis, had essentially ignored everything in the past and she was had no money, she was impecunious. So what we ended up getting was a vesting order for the postings of, of Addis to, to the plaintiffs. And what this essentially meant is that Justice Corbett was going to sign orders that said all of these accounts, and there was a list in the factum, now belong to the plaintiffs or now belong to a supervising solicitor, and their job was going to be to go out and contact the, the sites, the internet service providers, and, and take down this uh, content. And what there were some questions from that, you know, who is going to be the one who pays the supervising solicitor? Uh, you know, usually it's the, the party seeking the order and then they, they pay and then they get it back in costs. But in cases like this, you have someone who's impecunious, so it's just more money that the plaintiff has to pay out. Whether or not it's going to be enforceable outside of Ontario or Canada, we are dealing with the internet. And you know what happens if the individual continues their campaign? So you have to keep adding new accounts to the order. And so I just wanted to highlight how it was different before I pass this back to, to Laura. You know, on the screen here, I have just a, a quick little breakdown of the various torts uh, that were sort of addressed in the decision and how they may or may not have been appropriate. In this case, def there, a lot of the posts were found to be defamatory, um, but sort of the, the highlights of this is, you know, this, can, this does not require uh, there to be a visible or provable illness you know, the emotional distress, it, it doesn't have to be extreme. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it doesn't necessarily have to be defamatory. Um, or, and the issue with intrusion upon seclusion was that a lot of this wasn't private information that was brought out. And so ultimately, the, the judge found that this is why we need this new tort, because there were a lot of gaps uh, in, the, in, in the law at the time. And so I'll pass it on to the poll and Laura can take it away. A presentation wouldn't be complete if there wasn't one time where someone mute, forgot to mute at the appropriate or unmute at the appropriate time. Um, so the question is, what percent of adults in the United States, unfortunately, I couldn't find the statistics um, for Canada, have personally experienced on online harassment? We'll give it about 15 seconds. All right, survey says 40 to 50%, which is actually correct. It's 40, as we can see on the next slide, it's 44% uh, of Americans have experienced um, some sort of online harassment. Um, and what's very interesting um, and also quite disturbing is the fact that um, the survey found that 28% of Americans have been victims of severe online harassment. Um, despite the fact that cyberbullying obviously has been uh, has received a lot of attention um, in the news, particularly with sensational stories um, about the impact that cyberbullying has, the rates of online harassment we're actually seeing are increasing over time, not decreasing. Um, when you look at age demographics, um, this isn't actually a problem that is just faced with, um, by, sorry, faced by young people. Um, not surprisingly, um, a study found that um, for the age group between 18 and 29, two thirds of that group um, have been targets of online harassment and 41% of those surveyed in that age group um, had been subjected to severe online harassment. But when we look at the age group between 30 and 49, almost 50% have, um, have experienced online harassment and um, 50 plus um, individuals, 22% uh, of Americans, all Americans, have been the victims of cyber harassment. So clearly no group is immune and it's a very serious issue. 
So uh, we wanted to end the slide by just giving a, an example of a case that hits close to home um, and that most of us are aware of. So that's uh, the case of Amanda Todd, who was a 15 year old um, Canadian um, from British Columbia, who was the victim of severe cyber bullying. And she ended up um, after um, suffering a cyber attacks for two years, uh, committed suicide um, and had posted a video of YouTube explaining all of the um, harassment that she had been subjected to. Uh, but basically an intimate image had been um, sent of her um, to a stranger who she had formed a relationship with. And then that stranger um, tried to blackmail her um, by making her send additional uh, photos of her. Uh, the image was ultimately shared. Facebook pages um, containing her intimate images were created and then sent to contacts. She switched schools, but that didn't end everything. Um, she experienced anxiety, depression, a panic disorder, and um, because of this sexual exploitation and cyberbullying, and then ultimately, sadly, um, took her own life. But one of the reasons why this is important is the and has received renewed attention is what just happened in. Um, the in December of 2020, which was the man um, who was accused of cyberbullying, a Dutch man, was actually um, uh, extradited to Canada uh, to face charges, and his next court appearance is tomorrow. Um, so surely the type of conduct that Amanda Todd was um, subjected to would fall um, within um, this uh, new tort. Um, so we will wait to see how this is interpreted by the courts um, to deal with this extreme conduct, um, but we can expect that lawyers will be trying to advance these um, uh, arguments in the right circumstances, but with increasing um, frequency. So with that, I see that we have uh, four minutes uh, left for some questions. So I will, um, the first question is, uh, do you, and this is for you, Devin, do you have any sense of what the quantum of damages would be in the range of in situations um, where this tort has been established? So this hasn't obviously been tested yet, and this really didn't get canvassed at all in the decision. Uh, but when you're looking at sort of similar cases dealing with uh, intentional infliction of mental suffering, uh, it, it tends to be anywhere from you know twenty to $100,000 uh, in general damages, what I've seen in some of the cases. Uh, there's some commentary in uh, cases out there, especially the old Merrifield case, um, which not old, it was 2017, where they felt that cases like intrusion upon seclusion, which is generally capped at around $20,000 for damages, uh, attracts a lower level because it's, it's meant to be the, the private affairs. Uh, and so it's not about being disseminated into the public, whereas this is about you know, the public use and see internet. So I would, I would expect it to be, you know, fairly substantial damages awards because by the time you meet all of these hurdles, you are, you know, this is egregious conduct. So 20 to 100 based on some case law would be my, my best guess right now. Sure. So another question is, is there any evidence that this decision has stopped or prevented Ms. Attest from continuing her reign of terror? So, or do you want, I can, I mean, it's been two weeks, so, so yeah. far. <laughs> well, and, and the, the thing is that she does have to get permission to bring court actions and to continue court um, steps. Um, so it remains to be seen if she'll continue to um, use the court um, it, as her, um, you know, as a means of attacking people. Um, but uh, yeah, it's too early to say, I suspect not, um, but hopefully. And um, so one other question um, is in the one minute we have less, um, would it be excluded from your insurance policy? I, I'm happy to, to take yeah, it. Lord, go for it. Sure. So likely it would be an intentional act um, for the person who was such as Ms. Attas that was committing the um, the uh, harassment. The question would be whether um, if there was some sort of negligent parenting claim that was being advanced about a teenager that was harassing um, someone, um, so using the Amanda Todd example, whether um, 
the, that would require a, um, a response. So that kind of is a, a new topic um, that probably could be subject to another um, lunch and learn, um, but it, I guess it depends <laughs> in true lawyer answer. <laughs> so um, the last thing, it's one o'clock, so we'll end just by saying um, that we can circulate the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and um, if we go to the next slide, it announces our next two lunch and learns. So um, on March 3rd, we'll be talking about the amendments to the Occupier's Liability Act, which is quite significant dealing with the um, change in notice um, periods. Uh, and then on March 25th, we're dealing with a MIG case law update on how the LAT's been treating psychological injuries, chronic pain, and concussions. So with that, thank you so much to everyone. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Devin or myself, um, and we really appreciate you attending today. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great afternoon. And there's a couple of extra questions, but we will maybe post them on LinkedIn just to, to get you some answers. Uh, and I think that wraps it up. We'll see you all when we see you. Bye, everyone.